Hello, this is Dr. Alexander. I recorded this lecture after class, and then when I went to upload it, I didn't have any audio, so I'm re-recording it. And if you were in class, this is gonna be a similar, but maybe a little bit shorter version of what I said on Tuesday after class. I have a couple announcements to start off with. Um, as a reminder, there's no quiz this week. You do have a case study, and this is found under in your Evolve account, the HESI case studies and practice exams. And it's the skin integrity case study and it's um, from fundamentals. Um, I do have office hours this week. This is past, because today is Wednesday. Um, I have regular office hours on Fridays. I still have a couple openings left and then I'm offering sometimes to see people um, after class on Tuesday and I already have a few appointments then. As a reminder, because you had immediate review for your exam, you only can review your exam for up to one week after, so Tuesday is the last day. And I do have to give preference to people who were not successful on the exam, so they need to have the chance to talk to me first. So if you cannot um, meet next Tuesday and if all the spots on Friday are filled, then please reach out to me and see if we can work another time out. Okay, so this is gonna be pretty straightforward. We already talked a lot about integumentary problems because we talked about wounds and pressure injuries last week. And this is highlighting just some very specific skin conditions and also assessment for skin conditions in general. So as a brief recap, back from anatomy and physiology, your skin has a lot of different functions and the most important function is protection. It protects against pathogens. It's that first line of defense and also protects against water loss. The skin also absorbs UV rays, collects sensory information. There are a lot of nerves in the skin and in some areas like in our fingertips, there's um, more nerves than in other areas. And so it's very important for um, sensory input. And the skin also controls heat regulation. So the reason I talk about this is because if there's a problem with the skin, if there's a break in the skin integrity or a skin disorder, then some of these functions might not be working properly. So for older adults, skin is, there are changes that go on in the skin and one of them is wrinkles and just the psychological effect of aging and, and having that skin elasticity decrease. This can be difficult for males and for females. So don't underestimate the impact that aging can have on a person. And it's if somebody expresses concern or expresses frustration or sadness, um, let them just for any psychosocial intervention, make sure that you allow them the space to talk about it and ask them to expand on how they're feeling and validate how they're feeling. So older adults, because of chronic UV exposure throughout their life, they have photo aging and wrinkles. For all older adults, the skin becomes more dry, scaly, and itchy. And with that, especially with skin dryness, there's a greater risk of infection. Um, hair and nails tend to thin and atrophy, and for some reason, the toenails actually thicken. That's your random fun fact for today. So older adults have many different benign skin conditions. These are just three to, to think about and to remember. So this first one here is seborrheic keratoses. And if you see this, it looks like moles or nevi that have some kind of hardening on the top and almost like crusting. And so we'll see some other lesions later that look a little bit similar. And um, even if they are benign, you can't tell just by looking at a, at a skin condition to know for sure. So we would still want um, an older adult to report this and to have it checked out to make sure it's not anything more serious. Cherry angiomas, it looks like a mole, but they're actually little blood vessels and they kind of look like bright red moles. And this last one here is a skin tag. This is a very up close look. So skin tags are these um, raised lesions. They can actually kind of hang and be long and um, they can happen to people who are not older adults, but the tendency increases as people get older and they can be in places like the armpits and it's these benign kind of outpouchings of skin. So pathologic conditions, you learned about this in patho, but the A, B, C, D, E, and really the most, the biggest reason that we're looking for this and the most 
dangerous thing, the reason that we're so intent on having people report changes is because a lot of these are factors or manifestations of melanoma, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. But just as a reminder, I'm going to use this, um, this lesion, this nevi, this dysplastic nevi or melanoma has several of these conditions. And so first off, we have asymmetry. And so let's just say that I were to cut it in half this way. This half looks very different than this half. Border irregularity. So this, the border, as you can see here, is very um, rounded and kind of zigzags. It's not regular at all. There's not discrete, even borders. The color is varied. So this is a very dark brown. And then we have lighter brown, almost like three different shades here. So the same lesion with multiple colors is concerning. Um, diameter is if it's greater than six millimeters. So let's say this one is eight millimeters. That would be a concern. And then evolving or changing is looking at changes over time. And so perhaps this person originally had a nevi that was just this big and it stayed the same. And then there were these changes here. Sorry about that, that was my dog saying hi to you. So evolving and changing over time. This is a great teaching point for patients that for them to take ownership and take um, part of their care. So have them serially look at their nevi and monitor for any changes and report them quickly. So this is pretty straightforward. This is from Patho, your risk factors for skin cancer, fair skin, blonde or red hair, blue eyes, I would also say green eyes, so light eyes, but your book said blue eyes in particular, live near the equator or high altitude, so more sunlight and more of that, maybe that more intense UV ray, um, a family or personal history of skin cancer, outdoor occupation or hobbies or both, and then a history of tanning beds. So let's think about a patient. So let's give this lady a name. In class, the name that we gave her was Shannon. Let's say that she is Cynthia. And so risk factors, just looking at her, we can see that she has red hair, blue eyes, fair skin. Let's say her occupation, what's something that you're outside a lot for? In class, she was a farmer. Let's say that she is a park ranger. And the reason we're doing this is just so you can kind of um, put a face and an idea to the diagnosis and the risk factors, risk factors just to kind of keep it in your mind. So she has a family history where a, a close relative, so like a parent, had skin cancer. And um, let's say that she also has um, hobbies and um, that she really likes to swim and surf. And let's say that the characteristics, she has A, B, C, D, E changes. And so just as a way to kind of think about this would be our stereotypical person that's at risk for skin cancer. Actinic keratoses are precancerous skin lesions and they have irregular borders. I'm just gonna zoom in on this one here. So this lesion, if you look at it, it's kind of hard to tell where the lesion starts and where normal skin is. So here it looks like Maybe it starts here, but it's really subtle. And um, so it's not a discrete lesion. And on the top of it, there is a hard keratotic scale. So a scaling hard surface or even a horn, which is like something that kind of sticks out from a lesion. And so the part here that would feel firm would be here. So this is like a scaling that's um, hardened on top of it. This is the actinic keratosis, and then so non melanoma skin cancers are basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell. I'm going to start with squamous cell because they often arise from these actinic keratoses. And so, just from here, looking at this squamous cell carcinoma, you can see how they have some similarities. The edges look very similar, where they're kind of indistinct. 
but then you also have kind of this crater in the middle and there's this hard scaling as well. And by just by looking at these lesions, you actually cannot always tell actinic keratoses apart from squamous cell carcinomas. So they would both need to be assessed. Um, so they have a similar appearance. Basal cell carcinoma on the left here, they have more, uh, they're, they're pigmented. They sometimes be, might be um, closer to skin color, but they are a different color than the normal skin. They have what they call curled borders, but as you can see, these are much more pronounced borders. They are defined and there's an op opaque appearance and sometimes it might be called a pearly appearance. <clears throat> Melanoma is the most serious type of skin cancer in terms of morbidity and mortality. It has often a very fast course if it is metastasized and it can affect people who are quite young. So for women, I didn't know this until I studied this more, the most common area, I'm just gonna put most common because it doesn't mean it can't happen other places, but the most common sites would be the lower legs. And then for men, the most common would be the trunk and the head. So like the kind of the abdomen area and the head. So you see A, B, C, D, E changes. I'm gonna just look at this one here to talk about. So we have um, asymmetry. So let's say that I was to divide this in half. These two sides are very different. We have irregular borders. So this is very curved. They're pronounced borders, but they're very uneven. There are multiple colors. I see this color, a light color, a medium color. Um, let's say that the diameter is seven millimeters and that it is evolving, that maybe it used to start again just with this small area here, and then it's expanded out. It doesn't mean that every lesion that looks like this is melanoma, but it's highly suspicious, and it would need to be biopsied because you can't tell without a biopsy for sure if something is cancer or not. And the prognosis from melanoma correlates with the thickness of the lesion, so how deep it goes into the skin, and that is a, um, a worse prognosis than even if it's very, very wide. And obviously, if it metastasizes and goes throughout the body, then that is a worse prognosis. Sun protection, just some general tips. Um, first, we want to protect with clothing and hats and sunglasses. The greatest risk for sun damage is between 10 and 2, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. We want to use SPF 15 or greater, um, 30 or higher if somebody has higher risk. And a couple examples of higher risk would be a history of skin cancer. CA for cancer, or maybe um, photosensitivity for medications. Sunscreen needs to be applied 20 to 30 minutes before exposure. It needs to be reapplied every two hours and reapplied after swimming. So my kids love it when they swim because I make them come out of the pool dry off, reapply sunscreen in the wake 20 to 30 minutes before they get back in the pool so that it doesn't get washed right off. And then don't forget um, ears, toes, and lips can be um, um, at risk for sun damage. And um, this just kind of reinforces all that. Seek shade, especially during midday hours. And um, to cover, um, to use clothing to shield skin, ideally we'd want to have, um, depends on how hot it is obviously and feasibility, but actually wearing things that are long sleeved would offer the most protection where it's like breathable fabric, uh, but to protect against sun. So skin conditions, um, there are tables in your book um, and um, these are all um, common skin conditions that you need to be aware of. For this course, you really just need to know the basic manifestations. And I'll just tell you as a nurse practitioner, when I would have patients with rashes or skin, skin conditions, my own boss, who was a physician, would say, well, you can't really tell sometimes what it is. I usually, um, if I think it looks inflammatory, I try um, cortisone, like an anti-inflammatory cream. If I think it looks fungal, I'll try an antifungal, and if that doesn't work, I'll try the other one. So that's how similar some of these things can look. So for like a testic question, 
Um, for example, um, shingles is a viral skin condition that has a very distinct look. Um, and um, so just knowing the manifestations and knowing what something looks like is as far as you need to go, but just be aware of that. And then 25.7 is one that um, you can review, but it's conditions that we've already talked about so far in class. I'm just gonna put review. 25.7. So take a look at all of those and be able to have a basic understanding of what they each look like. Biopsies are when we take a sample of skin and that could be sometimes just taking a small portion if it's a large lesion or it could be trying to remove an entire lesion. So some different types there are um, scraping is where it's really just getting um, superficial cells So really just um, the surface superficial cells just taking a scraping. The next one would be a shave biopsy and I have a picture of this here and that's where there's a raised lesion and then it's almost like a curved razor blade that can go straight across and remove. Um, um, it could be just to take a biopsy of the top or it could be trying to remove the entire lesion and then that would be sent to the lab to be analyzed. Um, curatage is with a curette and it's kind of like a sharp spoon and it's where um, tissue is kind of scooped out um, with this curette. A punch biopsy is shown here and that would be maybe for a larger lesion and we just want to get a small sample to be able to examine it and so this um, device would be put into the skin, twisted around and then um, they, and then the, the piece of skin is taken out. It's kind of like a little apple corer. So it's a small core of skin that would be analyzed. And then um, excisional biopsy is where, um, as you can see here, it's, there are some margins around the lesion. And so this is where we're trying to remove the entire lesion. Um, so we wanna get clear margins to make sure that there's no affected um, that's cancerous tissue, if that's what we're looking at left behind. And so we want to have enough normal tissue where there's the clear margins, but not so much that um, it's um, losing healthy tissue. And also for thinking of things like wound healing and the edges being approximated. So treatments for um, skin conditions, there's electro desiccation or electrocoagulation, and that's where it's, or you might think of like cauterize. So heat is used to destroy tissue or to coagulate blood vessels, like the like if there are angiomas. Um, cryosurgery, the other thing you might hear this described as is, um, or you might have heard it, is liquid nitrogen, which is a very common type. And this is where um, there are sub-freezing temperatures that are, uh, that are applied to areas of the skin that have things like warts or skin tags or those seborrheic keratoses that we talked about that were benign lesions in older adults. And um, they're applied, they're um, ideally just applied to the lesion and not to healthy tissue around it. And um, it makes the area turn white briefly where it's frozen. And it can sting, I actually had to have it when I was a child for um, a condition that I had. So it can sting um, while it's happening and then the pain goes away. And then within two to three weeks, um, the area that was frozen tends to um, scab and fall off and then the new skin underneath it is able to grow. So a type of excisional treatment to try to remove an entire lesion is Mohs surgery or Mohs procedure. My mom has um, recently, in this past year, she's had a couple bouts of basal cell carcinoma and so she's had this done it was actually on her nose as you can imagine you don't want to take out any extra skin from your nose than you have to and so this is where skin cancer is removed layer by layer this can be done in one day potentially and that's where as you can see for this one um they attempted to get all of a tumor removed um and so they took out and you can see that they had clear margins here and then they would go and analyze this um in the lab um, a pathologist would actually look at this under a microscope and it can happen, like I said, this can be all day where they're just doing, going kind of layer by layer. And they would see that there um, 
is not healthy tissue. There's not um, normal tissue that, so that means there's still some tumor tissue here. And so they would come back a second time and they would take out some more and they would still see, oh no, it looks like there's still some cancer behind. And they would come back again and again, removing a little bit more at a time to until no more tumor cells are remaining. This can be a lengthy procedure, but the good thing about it is it preserves the maximum amount of normal tissue. After this is done, depending on how far down they have to go, um, people might need to have reconstructive surgery. There's a picture in your book of a gentleman that has a pretty large tumor um, removed from his forehead. And so they actually had to do a skin flap and do some reconstruction. I guess the, the thing to think about this, hopefully it's kind of clear from other, other topics we've talked about, but risk of infection is important for this because we do have that, that top layer of skin that is removed. And so making sure we're giving people good instructions for that. Pruritus is itching. This can be for a variety of reasons. The first thing we wanna do is try to break the cycle. So if there's a cause, if there's something that is um, predisposing somebody, we want to be able to stop that so we can get it under control. Pruritus is helped with cool environment. So on a test question, if it says to put warm compresses or to take a hot shower, that's gonna be the wrong answer. So cool environment, hydration or wet compresses. Wet compresses are just normal temperature usually. It's just um, room temperature, but it's just to moisten an area. Using moisturizers, especially right after a shower or a bath or after hydration to lock in moisture. Um, a cool or a tepid bath can be helpful. Um, topical drugs can help with the itching. And really what we want to avoid is lichenification. And there's a picture of this here where it's with prolonged scratching and itching, there can be this leathery hardened surface on the skin. So our goal is to minimize the risk of that if, if possible. And obviously control the itch, which is annoying and it can be painful. So trying to help the patient in that way as well. So just general skincare teaching. We want to use gentle products, so not harsh chemicals, not harsh soaps. Minimize radiation, so those skin care um, protection things we talked about, like sunscreen and avoiding tanning beds. General well-being, remember nutrition is very important for skin care. So exercise, rest, hydration, good nutrition is all important. And especially if somebody is high risk or if they have a history of um, precancerous or cancerous lesions doing frequent self-examinations and then also periodic dermatologic um, exams to get skin checks and this is head to toe where people might actually get all the way down um, to wearing nothing so they can be checked um, all over to make sure that there's nothing that's being missed and this depends on the patient depends on how serious their lesions are. My mom, like I said, has had um, two or three times where she's had to have things frozen or removed. And so she has skin checks every three months right now. For people that are just maybe fair skinned or have a lot of nevi, it might be yearly. It just really depends on the person. But we always want to tell people to let their provider know if they see anything that they are concerned about because something like melanoma can spread very, very quickly. And so we don't want people to wait or, um, until their, their next well, well check. For dermatologic surgery, we'll talk more about surgery in a couple weeks, but um, general post-op education, there are dressing changes. So we need to teach people about how often to do those, what type of dressings to use, if they have topical medications, to describe signs, signs and symptoms of infection and report them to the provider. And especially in the early period after surgery, cold packs can be helpful for um, swelling and pain, but it needs to be for 15 or 20 minutes at a time so that we still have adequate circulation. If people have chronic dermatologic conditions, this could be something like vitiligo or vitiligo, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, um, where there's multiple pigments, um, or I have a friend who has a daughter that has a really large port wine stain, which is a really large um, kind of birthmark. Um, there can be a psychologic impact of chronic conditions and it can impact people's adherence to treatment. It can be helpful to have support groups, other people that can really understand where you're coming from. And then camouflage is basically makeup. And so um, there are great products out there that can help to cover up lesions or if people have maybe scars from things like acne, um, having um, skincare products that don't make their condition worse and that are, um, that are kind to the skin. Physiologic effects, there can be scarring that can happen. And then again, lichenification can occur. So we wanna make sure we're teaching people how to keep their skin 
moist and well hydrated. So last but not least, we're gonna talk about cosmetic procedures. And those are topical would be things like creams, maybe for um, hyperpigmentation. So things that try, try to kind of even out um, the skin um, color. Um, if there are areas that are lighter or darker in certain parts of the skin to try to make it all an even tone. Um, injections are things like Botox or fillers. And then surgical therapy, a few examples are here, laser surgery, um, facelift, which where they actually remove part of the skin and pull it back. There's a picture in your book that shows before and after that's pretty dramatic. And liposuction is um, removal of, of fat from the, the body. Um, one thing just to think about is um, if people choose to get a cosmetic procedure, we have to really check our bias. Um, if we, it's not up to us. If a patient wants to have something done as an elective procedure and that makes them happy, then our job is just to care for them and to support them. So nursing management, if somebody has a, uh, a cosmetic surgery, um, general preoperative management, we'll talk about more with operative, but informed consent. And that the big three things to think about for informed consent are talking about risks, benefits, and alternatives. And informed consent is done by the provider, not by us, but we witness it. We'll talk about this much more when we talk about um, perioperative care in a few weeks. And then patient teaching, the better that we can prepare a person for what to expect during and after surgery, the more um, they'll retain. It's much easier to understand things before something than after. For post-operative management, we always want to be monitoring for infection, controlling pain. Again, ice packs can help early in the post-op period, especially for um, swelling or pain. For some types of procedures, like for a facelift, people might have supportive compressive devices to kind of keep everything in place. Um, we need to make sure that we're looking under that and checking for adequate circulation. And so we would actually want to remove the device or pull it back and check the skin. And the skin that is being compressed should blanch on pressure. So that is what I have for you for skin control. Short but sweet. If you have any questions about any of this, then feel free to reach out. You can email me questions or um, come to office hours. And one thing, just like with every other chapter we've talked about, it might be helpful to make tables to compare things like the basal cell, squamous cell, and um, carcinomas and melanoma. Um, and so just try to kind of apply things in a new way to help to retain it. And thank you, and I will see you in class on Tuesday. Um,